Yo, dude. What? Hey, everybody. This is Judah Hoover and uh, my sidekick right over here, uh, Josh Weidman. Uh, we What's are up? coming to you live at noon every day with the Build and Grow with Real Estate show here on the Real Estate Hackers Network. Our goal is to bring to you lively commentary, news of the day, but also actionable information on what is happening in the real estate world. The show is designed for real estate investors and realtors, and we hope that you find value with it. If there are topics that you think we are missing that we should be talking about, we definitely want you to let us know about them. Hello, Taz. Appreciate you joining us. Uh, when you, when you uh, jump in here, say hi to us. We greatly appreciate that. Uh, Monday through uh, Wednesday, we do about five to 10 minutes worth of news and then about 15 to 25 minutes worth of whatever content we feel is actionable and relevant uh, to the time. We focus heavily on what is actually working, not what just people in books, tapes, and seminars talk about. And we draw heavily on our experience. I mean, I've been doing this for, uh, let's see, I'm 40, I bought my 41. I bought my first rental property when I was 22, 23. So not quite 20 years. I know that you've got a similar uh, background, Josh. So we talk about what we know, what we've seen has actually worked. We do that yep. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday, we bring in a guest. And then Friday, we do a news wrap up focused not necessarily on uh, teaching or preaching specific techniques and content, but delve a little bit deeper into what's going on in the real estate news and what we think about it. This That's week, right. we're calling a bit of an audible. Yeah. This week, we do not have a guest. This week, tomorrow on Thursday, we are going to be doing our news wrap up for the week. And then on Friday, because it is the day that a lot of people have off for Independence Day, we are going to be going through the Bill of Rights, 10 Amendments, top to bottom, uh, what they mean, why we think they are important why the founders put them in place and kind of what life was like before them. And we are going to, you know, 10 amendments, 30 minutes. So roughly two to three minutes per amendment and why we, why we think that they are important um, as freedom loving capitalists. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I wanted to, uh, Jude and I were talking about this, doing something special for independence day. And I think that, you know, given the current climate that we're in, there's a lot of debate and a lot of contention about, you know, what is happening in our country? There's a lot of people that are up in arms. And and frankly, I think there's a little bit of uncertainty on where where the future lies. And I think it's important for us to look into the past a little bit and reflect as we celebrate our country. Let's let's take a look at what our rights really are and why they're there. You know, and um, yeah, I think that's cool. The, tomorrow is going to be a killer day. Yes. Um the news is blowing my mind. I feel like every every evening as I'm going through the news of the day, I'm texting Jude. I'm like, you will not believe this. Can you believe Check this, this just happened? This just happened. I told you so. I told you so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so, uh, so Judith, Scott, why don't you introduce oh, okay? You introduce yourself. You have the microphone. You introduce right, yourself sure. and throw it back over to me. So my name is Josh Weidman. I have, have been investing in real estate since December of 2006. Um, I, uh, I, I've done a whole lot of things, wholesaling, flipping houses, owned a property management company. I've been, I've been involved in real estate in a lot of different aspects. Right now, I'm a, a hard money lender right here in central Pennsylvania. Our office is uh, right outside of Hershey. We loan in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Northern Virginia, and DC. If you're looking for, uh, for funding on your next project, give me a call, 717-213-8488. I am not a broker. We are a uh, hard money bankers. We're a direct lender, which means that we are lending the capital to you directly without a middleman. I'm not going to shop this around. It allows me to work really quickly, um, you know, and underwrite your deal same day that you contact me. And then if the title work is ready and all your ducks are in a row, we can fund it the very next day. Judah, talk to, you know, tell us about you. My name is Judah Hoover. I'm an executive with Slatehouse Group, and I am a full-time realtor, uh, full-time property manager, full-time real estate coach and mentor, and a friend to all. I do not charge for coaching or mentorship. It's just something that I love to do, and I want to help people get to the next level. A buddy of mine just called me and said, hey, Judah, my church is selling our church building so we can move into something else. 
how do we go about renting that out? And they have a church that's interested in renting it, but they said, we don't even know, how do we come up with the rent? Like what's reasonable? Right. And I was able to give him two kind of formulas to work towards how he would how he would come up and, and do that. I'm doing the same thing right now with my church. We're looking at renting out different uh, spaces within the church to kind of be a community hub. Uh, I had a buddy who just emailed me and said, hey, Jude, I need a hard money loan um, in Harrisburg. Who can I talk to? By the way, I'm going to be sending that one over to you, Josh. So I, I, I am a realtor and I want to list your primary residence and I want to help you buy your next primary residence. I am a property manager. I want to manage your rentals and I want to help you buy and sell rentals. But more than that, I want to be your friend when it comes to any and all things real estate related. And I want to help solve problems for you and point you in the right direction to help you find problems. You can reach me at 717 766 Seven nine nine four. As long as you don't call me during church on Sunday mornings or after midnight, I'll probably answer. Beautiful. Um, I, on the other hand, do uh, I stay up really late? But don't call me at one o'clock in the morning. Anyway, <laughs> all right. So um, cool stuff today. We've been on the marketing bandwagon for the last two and a half weeks, um, talking about specific actionable things that you can do in your business to generate leads. Uh, we've started off with some lower cost, um, you know, lower cost items. We went through direct mail, phone drop, voicemail drops, text messaging. Um, what else did we talk about? Um, go ahead. We, we talked about um, bandit signs and flyers and a number of those different things. And I got to tell you, Josh, not just the bandit signs and flyers, but also the how to text message and, and, and doing direct mail and things like that. We haven't talked about anything that can't be implemented for as little as two or three hundred dollars a month. That's exactly. I mean, right. I mean, everything that we are talking about can be implemented for, let's say, five hundred dollars a month, and will get you two deals a month easily. And an average deal should put minimum five k in your back pocket, probably closer to ten to fifteen if you're doing flips or other things like that. But let's just say you're wholesaling and you're looking at a five k uh, per wholesale flip, you can turn five grand into 10 grand with what we're talking about relatively easy. And I mean, what's an extra 10 grand a month to the average person? That's that's $120,000 a year. And let, let me even live Let me even tone down expectations. Let's say you know nothing about real estate and you say, hey, look, I'd like to get involved and start implementing some of this stuff. Let's say that you, you know, there's a big learning curve here. And you say, look, I have $5,000 that I want to invest in my business and learn along the way, stuff like that. If you invest that $5,000 and you say, I'm going to put $1,000 a month aside, maybe you don't do one or two deals a month. Like, let, let's say you, you, you got to learn a lot, right? Like right. it's going to take some time, but you say, look, for the next six months, I'm going to dedicate myself to this. You can flip one property and make $50,000. That's right. un unrealistic. No, you can wholesale two or three deals and make 30 or 40 or $50,000 on a few deals. I mean, this right. is, it's, we're, we're talking large numbers with real estate and we're looking for big discounts. We're not looking for small ones. You know, we're looking for safe investments, not safe speculations, you know? And, and so- There's a difference between investing and speculating to be sure. That's exactly right. It's exactly right. And there's nothing wrong with speculation is if you got the money to lose, it's not a problem. But if you're looking for safe investments, real estate's a great place to go if you know what you're doing. And so for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about focusing on marketing, how to generate incoming leads. What do you do with a, a small budget? Because frankly, if you if you talk to some of the larger wholesalers, I mean, some of them spend $100,000 a month on marketing. And, and like, that's not an exaggeration. So, you know, you maybe scale down if they're doing eight to 10 units a month, you could be talking $30,000, $40,000, but you don't need to do that. And you shouldn't right. do that. You're just starting. Start with the small stuff. Today, we're going to talk about something called list stacking. And Judah, what do you know about list stacking? Um, well, I think that what the, the great thing about list stacking is it's a great way to, I think of it as like, I think of it as like, um, yeah. Okay. So in increasing your marketing ROI, I think of it as like a 10 speed bike up shifting. You know what I mean? You're pedaling just as fast, but you're getting much better results. And yep. I think 
and it is, I think that it's a little bit of a 202 strategy, but not necessarily. And it can def absolutely be something that you begin to implement right away. Okay, so Taz has a uh, has a good question here. How do you figure out if you uh, if things are a good deal, right? I have a ton of people calling, but I'm afraid to put things under contract. Here's what I always find. Um, I mean, with anything, right? It's supply and demand. If I'm sending out a ton of uh, a, a ton of loan offers and getting a lot of accepted offers and things like that, or if I am bidding on a lot of different properties. We all have a certain num amount of capital that we have available to us. Some people it's ten dollars. Some people it's ten million. But you can't spend more than you have. And and I'm talking about access to debt and all kinds of stuff like that. If you are seeing that, hey, I'm making an offer at a hundred thousand dollars or at seventy percent loan to value, or I'm sorry, not loan to value, but seventy percent of the ARV on these properties, and all my offers are getting accepted, you're offering too high. Right. Uh, when I first got started uh, out of college, not even real estate, just, you know, in business, um, I was selling windows and siding. Right. And I, the, the guy who owned the business that I worked for, he, he told me, he said, if you're booked more than two weeks out, you're not charging enough. Right. Because you have got to always be closing. But at the same time, you need to charge what the what the market will pay. Um, and so that's that's a, a good idea. Like, if, if you're putting out offers today and Taz and you're finding that people are coming back and saying, you know, the, the same instant, yep, I'll, I'll take the offer. Let's move forward. Maybe you have to give them a lower offer that they have to think about. And then if they keep coming back to you, you know, Hey, look, maybe your offers are too high or maybe you need to start, um, st start looking at the cash sales in the neighborhood. And that's something we can cover at, at a different point. Yeah, I think, I think the other thing that uh, Taz is talking about here is uh, he says that he's not confident in his numbers. And I think that this is almost a different show. Uh, and you should mark this down, Josh. Like, how do you get confident in your numbers? And, but it's, it's, I think that, uh, you know, in the military, uh, there's a, I, I have a lot of friends and family who have been in the military. And, and one of the things that they say is embrace the suck and, you know, you just got to deal with it and move forward. And it's the only way through it. And I think that in sales and business and entrepreneurship, you've just got to brace, embrace the fear. You've got to yeah. embrace the lack of confidence. It, it's like riding a two wheel or bicycle. I mean, to make two, uh, uh, bicycle references here in five minutes, if, if you'll allow me, dear listeners, when you start riding, you're going to be wobbly. When you start riding, it's a good thing you've got a helmet on. When you start riding, it's it's not the easiest thing. Come back and look at that same, uh, you know, 10-year-old five months, six months later, they're going over jumps and doing all kinds of crazy stuff, and you're worried that they're going to break their neck. Right. So you, the only way to get good at it is just by doing it. It sucks, but it is what it is. The only way you get – there was a George Clooney movie uh, called Three Kings. And it was these guys in Iraq and, you know, the first desert storm and they were going to go like assault this compound. And there was a, they were undermanned and stuff like that. And they were like, Hey, you know, one guy's like a little bit nervous. It's like, well, yeah, you only get the courage after you do the brave deeds. Yeah. You have to do the scary thing. And then you get the courage. It's just like push-ups. You get the muscles to do the push-ups by doing the push-ups. You can't actually get the muscles first to make it to do it. So if you are, if, if, if you're lack of, if you have lack of confidence and things like that, you just got to rock, rock and roll. Forward. So yeah, I said, I said, we should talk, take this show about that. And then I took three minutes to explain it. So I apologize <laughs> about that, but you know, that's, that's, there is no substitute for plowing forward and people who don't plow forward aren't actually your competition. Oh, I have a great story to tell you about that then, Josh. Um, yeah, let's, let's stay afterwards and we'll, we'll, we'll design a show around this buddy. Okay. So. I don't know. Um, or to, let's talk about the concept of list, list stacking. You know, imagine you have different marketing lists, right? You have a non-owner occupied list. You've got your out of state owners. You have your, um, you know, your evictions. You have your pre foreclosure list. You have your probate list. You've got your tax delinquency. So all this kind of stuff, right? The idea here is to combine all those lists and find where there's overlap on the list. All right. And what I like to start with here is I'd like to start with a case study. OK. Um, all right. What I've found is the best deals 
come from problem situations. They don't come from problem properties. Oftentimes people start looking for problem properties and they're like, oh, that's the ugliest one here. Look, there's a lot of ugly properties. If you're just going to stick with those, you're going to be buying the problems of the owner. What we want to do is look for problem situations. And sometimes that means it's a banged up property, but that's not the only thing. So imagine you got this guy. This is Joe. All right. Joe is a, a pretty interesting guy in his mid 20s. He uh, he gets married. Right. He starts his own business and he's making good money. He buys a nice house with his wife and they have three kids. Right. And, you know, here he finds himself in his, you know, in his mid early to mid thirties and things start going wrong. You see, Joe's had a, a rough five years. It's all started with a failure in his business. His business starts failing. And when that happens, it triggered problems with his marriage. And then, you know, he starts going through a divorce because he has problems in his business. He doesn't have the money to upkeep his house. And so, you know, the front gutter falls off the house and He's got so many other things going on. He didn't even think about it, right? He didn't, he didn't even notice it. But then, you know who does notice it? The neighbor. They call the township and they're like, yo, this guy, Joe, has a banged up house over here. And I do not like the way it looks. So the guy from License and Inspections drives by, writes Joe a violation on the property, right? In addition, he's got three kids. You know what three kids could do to a house? I mean, Judah's got four. I've got three. Like it's a constant repair, fix, clean up, you know, and if you don't do that, things can go downhill really quickly. So the house is a little banged up. The nice thing about Joe is that when he bought his house, his business was doing great. He put 50% down on the house so he could afford the payments. But guess what? Now he can't afford the payments. He's in arrears. The bank is threatening foreclosure. And because he put 50% down on the property and never thought that he would have any problem paying the taxes, the type of mortgage he got allowed him to pay the taxes separately and not escrow them. So he's behind on his taxes. He's looking at a foreclosure. He's going through a divorce. His house is a mess. He's got property violations and his, and his business failed. Like he's got a lot of issues, the least of which is this house, right? Meanwhile, me and Judah, we decided we're going to do a mailing campaign to a couple different people, uh, a couple different lists, and, and start marketing to them. And don't you know it, Joe shows up on a bunch of different lists. He shows up on our divorce filings, the municipal violations, tax delinquencies, pre-foreclosures, and high equity lists, all, all of them. Now, in addition to Joe, oh, God. Joe. I was just going to say, well, this sounds great in concept and theory. So are you telling me that I have to buy all five of those lists separately and then I have to sit there with uh, law and order playing in the background as I look for matches across all these lists? What if I miss the matches? Dude, just you, why must you go to slide four when I'm on <laughs> Right? Right? Come on. Come on. Um, Sorry. Right, so, Sorry. But, but here's the idea, right? Start with... We were already going to mail and already going to market to the divorce list. We were always already going to market to the municipal violations, tax delinquency, all these things. It is very, very like, okay, so I'm going to tell a little story here, right? So Philadelphia is a city that a good portion of the city doesn't pay their property tax because it's so low and the value of the properties are nothing, right? right. And that's changed over, over the years. But to do a, to get a list of tax delinquencies, you might as well take half of the money and just burn it because right. at least half of those properties, they could give them to you and you don't want them. Right. Right. But a friend of mine, he wrote, he had a, a program or write a program that would go through the tax delinquent list. And what he would do is filter it by specific zip codes or, or specific zip codes with the, what is it? Three or four digit extension where you can actually Extended show. Extended four is the term you're looking for. There we go. Um, but he was able to identify geographic locations where property values were really strong, where it was very consistent neighborhoods, where it was a, like upper middle class neighborhoods or, or higher, and was able to identify property tax delinquencies in those areas. Well, guess what happened? It, when they had those delinquencies, it wasn't just a tax delinquency. There's a reason that somebody doesn't pay their taxes if they have a $500,000 house. Right. There's a reason, you know, and, and it always has something else to do with it. But, you know, in a, in a small town, tax delinquencies, it might be 10 people, 
right? It might be 10 people on the list. Pre foreclosures, you might have a hundred of them. High equity list, you know, maybe that's 2000. But the idea here is that we're, we're going to buy these lists anyway. We're already putting these lists together. And whether you're pulling them off the MLS or you're paying somebody else to, to pull the data for you, or you're buying a list or whatever the case might be, these are lists that we're already using. Okay. So it's not like an additional cost. It's like, these are already the targeted lists that we're looking at. Now, Judah, do you think it's more likely that this guy is going to sell us his house or is it more likely that the couple that everything's going right, but they just decide that they're going to split and go to separate ways, you know, and they have an amicable relationship and, and no kids and plenty of money in the bank. Do you think they're going to sell us for sell their house? No, for this? Those, those, those types of situations, oftentimes the second situation there, the non Joe situation there, they're going to uh, fight through their attorneys, pick a realtor, get it listed with that realtor and come up with what the equity split is going to be when they sell the property. Right. And and even if they're willing to sell you their property, it probably isn't going to be the first time you contact them or the second or third or fifth. They might consider it. And six months, nine months, a year down the line, they decide, hey, maybe we'll sell through, you know, through a cash offer. Right. The idea here is that these individual lists, these individual marking lists, they are, we're looking at individual problems. And oftentimes, Individual problems are not an indicator that somebody's willing to sell their house for less than market value and quickly. Right. But it's often a case that when one of these things occurs, one of these problematic situations occurs, there are a host of others. So right. let's, look, let's look at another scenario that is kind of relevant to today, right? This is Sherry. Now she lives in Philadelphia, but Sherry is a really is really smart with her money. She's been smart with her money for a long time. And Sherry decided that Philadelphia is an uncertain market, but you know what? Lancaster City looks really awesome. So she bought a bunch of rentals in Lancaster City. And things are going well. Sometimes she has some foreclosure or, or excuse me, evictions and but ultimately as a whole, everything works really well. But then this little thing called COVID-19 came up. And COVID-19, I mean, she wasn't using Slate House Group to manage her properties. And so, you know, in the beginning of COVID, like in February, she filed eviction on two of her tenants. So she, that triggered, you know, the eviction process. But then March comes and there's a moratorium on evictions. So she's waiting to go to court on two of them. For the rest of her properties, she's only collecting 30% of the rents. Everybody else is like, yo, we have at least until July. We don't have to do anything. And actually, what is it? August now? Do you get pushed so off? I, I just I just got a list the other day from one of the things that like if you filed at this point and you've done this, then you can do this and this. It's like a, it, it's like a matrix almost. Yeah. Uh, it looks like a bingo board of like if these things happen between these dates, this is what you can do now. And that's just one of the municipal courts. It's so complicated. It's not even funny. That's that's frustrating. Yes. Um, all right. <laughs> So that that's that you know uh, whatever she didn't even know when she can evict here. Well, even though Sherry's really smart with her money and she makes good income, because she has a handful of properties, and because the tenants aren't paying, she tried to stay up. She paid in March, she paid in April, but now we're in July and she's she's two months behind on her payments, and the banks are like threatening to foreclose on her on these properties, and she's like, man, this sucks. This is awful. Uh, awful. Excuse me. In addition, watch this. Even though the tenants aren't paying the rent, they're ticked off that Cherry's not fixing the, the air right. conditioning. The right. back the back door of their house is, is busted. You know, they're ticked off that they their son kicked a hole in the wall and she hasn't come out and fixed it. So now there's violations on these properties because you know, look, a squeaky wheel with a tenant is the loudest wheel, right? Yep. So guess what? Sherry all of a sudden. She shows up on a lot of mine and Judah's marketing lists again. She's on a pre foreclosure list. She's on the eviction list. She's a municipal violations list, non owner occupied, and out of town owner. All of these, boom, one after another, after another, after another. Now, do you think that the guy in California that has three or four rentals in, in Lancaster City that are performing well because they're A plus neighborhoods, 
And, you know, just because he's in California, he's going to be more willing to sell his properties than Sherry. Probably not. Right. Sherry's a prime candidate. She's got pain everywhere and she's looking at her great financial situation and her great credit score, you know, and her great future going down the tubes and going, what the heck do I do here? This is a perfect, you know, scenario of what we're looking at and could be looking at in the very near future with, um, you know, with a scenario. So, where- what, so what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing um, another list stack, but a different set of circumstances. Still, That's still right. uh, pre foreclosures, but in this case, we've got uh, evictions, municipal violations. At this time, though, they're non owner OCK properties, and this time we are looking at out of town owners. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know. All right, I'm going to go back here to something. I just saw a comment from Taz. Um, So do you want to waste time on non-Joes and non-Sherry's? It's a really great question. It depends on how many deals you want and how fast you, you know, how much money you want to spend on marketing, how much return you want to get. So let's go to the last and final slide here, how this works. So the, the idea here is that you want to identify your best possible prospects. And you can do this in two ways. And like the second way is, is essentially a Google search, but the first free way, depending on the size of your lists, you can very simply either write a program in Excel, like a macro that goes through and matches them up and spits them out. That's not very hard. And, you know, if you go to Upwork, you can hire a programmer to do it. If you know Excel, you can do it yourself. It's not, it really isn't that difficult. Um, Or if you've got time and you're not talking about thousands of entries, you know, cut and paste them all into one into one um, one Excel file. Let, have one of the columns be labeled with the type of list that it came from, and then sort the list by the the name of the owner. And when you do that, what you'll have is it's like Joe Smith, one two three Main Street. You know, foreclosure. Joe Smith eviction. Joe Smith non owner. You know, uh, so you'll see like a bunch of Joe Smiths in in in, uh, in, in a chunk there. That's exactly That's right. Good. I mean, yeah, it's a lot of time. time. But look, if we got twenty leads, twenty people that were so highly motivated, they have ton- you know they have tons of equity. You know that they have to sell, and the time is short. You want to focus the most amount of time on those people as you can. Yeah, you can go knock on those doors if you have to. Well, that's exactly right. those are the people you pay a skip tracer two to three to five bucks a piece if you have to, to come up with a cell phone number. Cell phone numbers, email address, social media. I mean, everything. Yeah, that Google you- those individuals. See if you can send up a private Facebook message. That's right. And you're going to reach out to them. The idea here is to squeeze that six to 12 month period of marketing down to 30 to 90 days. And I'm not talking about call them a hundred times. You know, I right. mean, that it's pretty annoying and people will just block your number. But it does mean... Call them three times a week until you talk to them. Call every number. Call their brother and sister and uncle and aunt and everybody that's ever lived at the property and figure out a way to get in touch with them. Right. Um, you know, that is a big deal because once you get in touch with them, you can solve their problem. And and the fact is, you already know what their problems are. Right. You know the details, but you got a really good idea of what you can do to help them get out of this problem and this pain in their life. You're solving a situation. You're, or you're, you're, so, you're providing a solution to their problem, which isn't the house. The house yep. just happens to be part of it. And, and list stacking is such an important, valuable thing right now that most data companies like Melissa Data and others like it that I can't think of right now, which I was listing several, so I wasn't just- List source them. is another one. Uh, what's that? List, list source. source. Yep, yeah, exactly. Um, USA Data, there's a bunch out there. Uh, they will sell you, you know, entries and they they want to sell you as much as possible and that you be as profitable as possible. So they will they will talk to you about uh, list stacking as well. That's right. And if you don't want to use their list stack for whatever reason, you can absolutely go to Odesk or Fiverr or whatever and upload. Hey, I have three Excel spreadsheets. I need you to search uh, for commonality, and they will you'll get you'll get that back in. 20 minutes. Yep. Yep, exactly. Um, and then last but not least to address Taz's question. 
just because somebody shows up on one list doesn't mean they're not motivated to sell. Just because only, you know, they're only showing up on one of your lists, unless you're pulling absolutely uh, every data point that you can think of. I mean, the fact is, there's a ton of lists that I haven't even thought of yet. You know, I had a, I had a friend who created a list. He, he uh, it was a recovering drug addict. And he knew that when he was 18, his, and uh, he got arrested, right? His parents would have done anything to hire him a lawyer. And in fact, they would have sold their house. And like, it was like the perfect house to, for him to buy because it was a beat up house. They had some equity. It was a very unique situation. He created a marketing campaign around that and, and it was fairly successful. Wow. Um, right. Very, very interesting and unique. But the, the point is, unless you have all of the data points and you've got every single list that, that anybody can imagine, there are going to be people that show up on just one list that are going to make a lot of sense. It'll make a lot of sense to them to sell their house through you. Yeah. Taz says here that he's been avoiding those lists because everyone and their mother gets them. I, I would I would agree with you, but that's also why you do um, list stacking so that you are, you know, if you have five lists and there's each a thousand people on those lists, that's 5,000 different data points, uh, 5,000 different entries. But if you combine them, maybe it's down to 50, maybe it's down to 20. Maybe, yeah. maybe you don't look for people that are on all five lists, but you look for people that are on any four of the five lists yeah. or three of the five lists. You know, you, you do whatever you can do to get that number to be, you know, about 500 uh, mailings or something like that. And you, and you get that sent out. And yeah, Taz, I mean, I get it. Everyone's mailing to it, but that's why you do it consistently. Uh, no one says, oh, I don't want to open up a, uh, a pizza place in the in the food court of the mall. There's already other, there's already, you know, seven or eight other restaurants there. Well, yeah, I mean, because that's where everyone goes for food. So there's a reason why everyone markets to these. And usually when people talk about lack of success with direct mail campaigns, it's because they're not list stacked. Right. That's exactly right. And, and beyond that just because other people are there i mean a lot of these lists are so deep that no one person is going to pull all of the all of the sellers out of that list i mean you've got you get no non owner occupied in a metropolitan area you can be talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of properties at any given time right that's why you know when you have large data sets it's really important to filter them down by more than one uh, indicator. Also, a lot of people have never really gone through crisis in their life, and they don't realize how much crisis can change your life in a 24 yep. to a 72 hour period. Yep. And so like when you're going through a divorce or when you're going through a foreclosure, a new event might happen that totally shifts what you're doing. So if you got a postcard from a company on a Monday or Tuesday and you throw it out on a Thursday or Friday, that could be it's seen as a godsend to you. And you yeah. can be cursing that you threw out the postcard on Monday or Tuesday and you're so glad you got one on Friday. Just remember when this whole COVID thing came out, remember how remember how two or three days would go by and we're like, oh my goodness, was that already last week? That feels like a year ago. Yeah. And really only a very short amount of time would go by, but we were as a nation going through crisis. We were individually going through crisis. And and new information was changing and shifting our paradigm on a very oh, regular right. basis. So don't worry about other people doing this. I think that list stacking is so important that you almost should not be doing direct mail without list stacking. Unless you're doing something very creative uh, like Josh's friend did where he found minors or close to minors who had drug charges and mailed to their parents. Uh, you know, if you can find like a highly specialized list, uh, that would be awesome. I know a friend who targeted out of state, multifamily, non-owner occupied, non-owner occupied, out of state, multifamily units. Yeah. And, you know, he, he came up, then what he did was he came up with a, a postcard specifically about them. If you want to go one step further, you can look at properties like that that uh, recently had a listing expired. 
you know, so they were trying to sell their out of state, non owner rock multifamily property with the realtor and it, and they couldn't. Yeah. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can list stack and have very, yep. very, very successful. A case in point here. That's, that's really relatable. There are agents and it, it hasn't happened recently because of the, the how hot the housing market has, has been, but there are agents out there that make their living off of expired listings. Right. I mean, make their living and do really well off expired listings. That's all they target. That's all they market to. And yet these are these are people that have signed a contract with another agent. They've listed the property for six months and it hasn't sold. Yeah. You know, realtors, realtors are lazy. I mean, when you there should it should be known in society that if you have a listing and it expires, oh my goodness, my phone is about to blow up. Oh my goodness, this is going to be awful. Because yeah. there are so many realtors that just like if a quarter of them called a quarter of 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 the um uh, the the expired listings, people would dread their listing expiring because they knew that they were going to get so many phone calls. That's right. You get. I mean, I've had listings expire. I, I'm a realtor that it's called expired listings and love calling expired listings. I'm an investor that is called inspire, expired listings and love calling expired listings. It, there's, there's, it is so undertapped. And it's one of those things that everybody assumes, you know, you tell a realtor, what should you do to find business call expired listings? Uh, everybody does that. No, everybody can do that. Not everyone does that. Right. Taz, to answer your question on where you can get lists, I, most counties and towns and municipalities have a GIS system right now, um, which is a graphic interface, something or other system, I forget, but it's, it's a really great data source that you can pull out. And I've pulled data from there and then just paid people a fiber to say, hey, um, here's the address subject property. Here's the, uh, here's the, here's the property of where where it was, you know, where the tax bills are sent to. So so in that data was where the tax bills are sent to. That's how you know if they're a foreign owner and foreign is in not owner occupied. Have they owned the property for more than 20 years? Great. I want to send them a, I want to send them an alley. You know, because because of the, it's likely that they have higher equity. Now what you can also do is uh, with title companies and other things like that, you can also get, take that data over to the recorder of deeds office and find out when the last time that there was a mortgage recorded against the property. Because just because they've owned it for 20 years doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't refinance two years ago. So right. there's a bunch of different ways that you can um, get lists that you don't have to call a list company. But list companies sell cheap data, man. They do or they don't? They do. It is. It's. I mean, it's. You're not going to break the bank calling calling a list company to buy uh, to buy a list to mail to. Well, sometimes you can. I mean, depending on how if selective. If you buy it, too big a list and you break yeah. your budget, sure. But you know, it's not like it costs ten thousand dollars to to call a list company and buy a no. list. No, absolutely not. I mean, if you're if you're looking at a reasonably sized list of let's say five thousand or below, I mean, you expensive is probably a quarter a record. That's really expensive. Right. And that's and that's going to be a really selective list. So anyway, um, yeah. So look, implement list stacking with the current marketing. Continue going out there trying to find deals. If you've got any questions, you want anything um, that, you know, think we should cover another topic uh, in, the, in the upcoming shows. Please let us know um, if you enjoy the content for today. Make sure you like and share. Uh, and we'll be back here at one o'clock tomorrow. One o'clock tomorrow. Judah, Judah's, Judah's busy. So Judah's you know, got to go play realtor tomorrow at noon. So mm -hmm. if you want me to play realtor for you, all you have to do is give me a call. Awesome. All right. We'll, we'll see you tomorrow, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Until then, uh, have a great day.